Welcome to our session scrutinising last week's budget with uh, the Chancellor. Uh, can I invite you to introduce yourself? Jeremy Hunt, Chancellor of the Exchequer. And Will McFarlane, Director of Strategy Planning and Budget in the Treasury. Um, so we heard from the Office for Budget Responsibility yesterday and we heard from a great panel of economists in, in the afternoon and uh, it's great to have this opportunity to ask you, Chancellor, directly uh, a few of the things that um, we've been talking about. So I'd like to start by acknowledging the three economic priorities that you've been working with in terms of reducing inflation, growing the economy and ensuring that debt is falling. But I wanted to sort of step back from that and welcome the fact that markets have stabilised, that inflation is significantly lower, on track to get to 2% according to these forecasts. And just ask you to articulate how you would frame your economic strategy. Well, I think the most important thing is to put in place a plan for long-term growth for the economy. Um, and uh, my belief is, if you look around the world, that that means uh, you can see that you know, the countries that are growing the fastest tend to be ones with lower taxes, North America and Asia in particular. So I do think <coughs> it means having a path to lower tax. But that is a means, not an end. Um, and what the means, what, we, what the end is, is more investment in the economy. That means more growth, more productivity, um, ultimately more money for public services that we all depend on. So, um, you know, I think the core of what I'm trying to do is more investment, more jobs, uh, and prosperity that isn't just concentrated in the southeast of the country, but spreads to every corner. Thank you. And I think you've done a number of fiscal events now, and we can sort of see a theme coming through in terms of uh, trying to unlock some of the challenges that we heard from the economists yesterday about productivity, about creating longer term growth capacity in an economy where employment is relatively high and so on, non-inflationary sustainable growth. So we've heard you make quite a few measures that are aimed to do that. But I think you could also say about last week's budget, there were a lot of very little uh, fiscal measures, often quite small measures in terms of their impact on the finances, some, a lot of smaller tax hikes, which in aggregate seem to be being driven by the fiscal headroom itself, so that you are being almost driven by your fiscal target as opposed to being able to take a strategic approach to fiscal decisions. Do you recognise that characterisation? I recognise the first part, and if I may say, Chair, not the second part. So, um, Yes, indeed, the fiscal rules are guardrails, and I think it's right that you have those guardrails, and it's important that everyone can see that we are uh, following rules, which mean that by the end of the period you are, bringing, you are beginning to bring down debt, um, and so that is absolutely right. Um, but um, in terms of sort of suggesting that the measures were a bit higgledy piggledy um, for want of a better word I wouldn't agree with that so on, on tax there is a very clear plan uh, we want to bring down tax on work and the unfairness of double taxation on work because that brings more people into the labour market so the national insurance cuts uh, bring about 100,000 people in and another 100,000 for the national insurance cuts that were announced in the autumn that's filling about one in five vacancies across the economy um, so they are, in terms of economic growth, some of the most destructive taxes. So it was my strategy to arrange our tax affairs to, wherever possible, reduce the disincentives to work. And I think that was a consistent pattern. I'm sure we'll have more questions specifically about national insurance as we go uh, through this afternoon session. But I also wanted to ask you about the fact that it was in the newspapers the morning of your budget that you were going to make this change to national insurance. You can't have been happy about that. That must have been an unintentional leak. Where did it come from? Um, I wasn't happy. It wasn't an intentional leak. I think all chancellors would prefer uh, the contents of their budgets to remain uh, uh, secret until the final decisions are made and until they've been announced to Parliament. 
Um, and, you know, it, it is very disappointing um, that uh, actually not just for this fiscal event, but for the last few fiscal events, uh, it has become very difficult, partly because, you know, journalists uh, call up people in the Treasury and say, I'm going to run this story unless you give me a flat denial that this is going to be in the budget, and we don't want to say anything that's not true to journalists, and so they, uh, they make a gamble on that. Um, so I do think that uh, it is incredibly frustrating uh, for all concerned, not least because some of the stories that went out about the contents of the budget actually did so before the final decisions had been made, so they were purely speculative. So can you just outline for the committee which parts of the budget that were released over the week before were deliberate news stories planted by the Treasury or Number 10, and then which were just educated and informed guesswork by journalists? Well, what I can assure you without going, because I don't know the details of, of these conversations because I'm not part of them, but what I can assure you is the principal measures were not leaked in advance, the, the, what you would consider to be the main points in the budget, and we wouldn't have wanted them to be. You'd agree with my hunch that the national insurance was inadvertently in the newspapers that morning? Correct. And what about this claim from Martin Lewis that he was told about the change to the high income child benefit charge before Parliament was? Uh, no. Uh, no, he wasn't told? Correct. So Martin Lewis is not telling us the truth? Well, I haven't seen his comments, but uh, he was not told about the, the increase in the threshold in high income child benefit charge, no. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to change the subject um, to the uh, welfare target itself. And um, you've acknowledged in your documents that the government has yet again missed the welfare target. And I just want to find out that's something that Parliament has enacted and we keep on missing it, are you going to ask Parliament to change that or are you going to try and get back under the welfare target? Well, um, the way that uh, particular element of scrutiny is set up is that uh, ministers have to report to Parliament at the start of every Parliament um, whether they are on track mm. and if they're not on track, what they're going to do to get back on track. Mm. Um, and, and that remains the case. Um, but. You know, to answer your question very directly, I'm concerned that we're breaching that cap. Um, and we have announced a number of very significant <coughs> measures that bring down welfare spending, um, but in a way that is compassionate and in the interests of disadvantaged people, because we think, uh, you know, the vast majority of times it is in people's interest to be in work and not dependent on welfare. And the Back to Work programme that was announced at the autumn st statement by myself and Mel Stride uh, will, for example, see a reduction in two th by two thirds of the number, being, number of people being signed off <coughs> as long term sick and disabled and not having to look for work. And that, that, that's verified by the OBR. So there are some very significant welfare changes, and we continue to look very carefully at what more we can do. So are you saying that we can expect a plan to get back under the welfare cap? Well, um, with specifically with respect to the welfare cap, we need to see where we are at the start of the next parliament. But if you're saying, will we keep looking for reforms uh, that can bring people off welfare and into work, absolutely yes. Uh one of the things we heard yesterday from economists was around this uh, stated objective of uh, debt falling. And we know that you've made your fiscal headroom, I think, with £8.9 billion to spare. But can we ever expect as a country to see a sustained reduction in the country's outstanding debt as a percentage of the economy back to the same sort of levels that we had before the pandemic? I think it's going to be a long and difficult journey, but I think it's right that we try. And uh, I read the transcripts of your um, interviews yesterday with the IFS and the Resolution Foundation and the OBR. And it's interesting that uh, you know, they commented that the fiscal rules are some of the loosest and then you have other respected economists like Andy Haldane who say they are too tight. 
and I think we are broadly in the middle ground. I think that in a situation where, you know, you know, we were encouraged to hear the January growth figures this morning, but the economy is not growing particularly fast at the moment, um, and indeed the last published numbers were in a technical recession. Um, <coughs> because we are in a high interest rate environment because of the need to bring down inflation. But in that context, um, it is right to try, within sensible fiscal rules, to do everything you can to get the economy back growing again. And that's what I've been trying to do. But your hope is that growth will be the thing that changes, that will actually start to see um, outperformance in terms of that percentage debt in the economy? Well, growth is the kind of elixir that uh, uh, chancellors, shadow chancellors, all political parties uh, say they are aiming for. Um, perhaps the best way of putting it is uh, if you deliver growth, and I believe we've got a very strong plan to deliver much higher levels of growth than we're currently seeing, then you have choices. You can uh, use that growth to bring down taxes, to increase public spending, or to bring down debt. And so I think the, the smart thing to do is to give yourself those choices. And the measures that you've brought in in all your fiscal events so far, I think the Office for Budget Responsibility says they do increase the sustainable growth potential of the UK economy by about 0.7 per cent. Does that right. yeah, you do recognise that number? Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you, Angela. Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, uh, Chancellor, um, uh, but you see Diane Abbott on the TV. You just want to hate all black women because she's there. I think she should be shot. Uh, Mr. Hester, um, was this rude or racist as a comment? Um, it was both. Uh, it was a despicable comment that should not have been made. Uh, he's not apologised for being racist. He's only apologised for being rude. Do you think he should apologise for the racist well, comment? Well, he has apologised for his comments, uh, which uh, I believe were racist and rightly so. Now, um, you're Chancellor of the entire country, but if you were Treasurer of the Conservative Party, would you return the £10 million pounds that this man has donated to the Conservative Party? Well, um, I'm not Treasurer of the Conservative Party, but um, I don't believe that someone should be cancelled for a comment they made in the past and for which they have apologised. But that does not make the comments any less despicable, and I don't defend them. You're happy to accept the money, but you don't defend the comments. I think the comments are despicable, and I also think that uh, the Conservative Party's record on these issues speaks for itself, uh, with the first uh, ethnic minority Prime Minister, uh, an incredibly diverse cabinet. I'm incredibly proud of what my party has done to increase diversity, and we stand on that record. Do you think that Frank Hester is a fit and proper person to be in receipt of hundreds of millions of pounds of taxpayer money? and public contracts, given his private attitudes? Well, um, I was uh, health secretary when uh, he rather was... a lot of black and ethnic minority workers in the health service, after all. I was health secretary when um, a number of those contracts were given to him. Um, to my not... First of all, no contracts are ever decided by ministers. They're always done at arm's length. But I believe that the vast majority of the contracts he won were with individual GP surgeries, because I think what he does is a, a piece of GP software. So they weren't even... Uh, but he's got all our data. Uh, they weren't even at... Uh, well, th that data sits with uh, the NHS, and uh, that is uh, a decision that uh, GP surgeries have made. Um, in order to modernise their systems. But in financial services and that sector, we have, um, we have regulations about fit and, fit and proper persons. Do you think that uh, this man is a fit and proper person to be in receipt of so many hundreds of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money? Well, um, I, I'm not going to defend his comments, as I said to you. I think they were despicable and wrong, um, and he's apologised for them. And I don't think that... Uh, uh, the contracts that you talk about, uh, my understanding is that most of them were granted long before uh, those comments were made, but that is really irrelevant. The point is those comments were wrong, they were racist, he's apologised for them, I think we should accept that apology, um, and uh, I think that's really all but I have to say. There shouldn't be consequences for that, having that kind of view or behaving in that manner, if you're rich. 
or you're a company owner? There should be well, no consequences. Well, um, I think that, you know, the consequences in terms of public uh, shaming of what he's done have been pretty significant, actually, and he has apologised. It's been referred to the police as well, so... Uh, right, to talk uh, about Chancellor, um, issues, um, uh, well, I'm going to... <laughs> Um, analysis shows that for every 10 pence taxes have gone up in this parliament, you've only given back 5 pence. And at the end of this parliament, taxes are going to be higher uh, than they've been as a percentage of GDP since World War II. Um, it's not much of a record, that, is it? Well, I think, with great respect, eh, Angela, you should listen to the people who you had in front of the committee yesterday. Uh, Torsten Bell, who's and not known for his conservative sympathies, said that the reason taxes have gone up is because of the pandemic, uh, because of higher debt interest costs. The Office of Budget Responsibility pointed to, David Miles pointed to, the war in Ukraine. Um, I think it was right that we gave £370 billion of support to businesses during the pandemic. It stopped thousands of businesses going bust. I think the Labour Party supported those, uh, that support wholeheartedly. Um, we then gave a further £94 billion of support during the cost of living crisis following the Ukraine war, paying about half people's energy bills. Again, your party, and I'm sure you supported that. But we also have to be honest with people. When you have those extremely unusual global uh, <coughs> emergencies, there are financial consequences. And that's why I've never hidden from the fact it's more painful for me than I expect it is for you as a, a Labour politician, but I, I had to put up taxes, yes. And uh, I now want to bring them down. And we are not going to bring them down all in one go. Uh, it's going to take time, but in the autumn statement um, and in the spring budget, we made a start. And the tax cuts that I chose were the ones that are going to most help the growth of the economy and deliver the 0.7% the increase in GDP mm -hmm. that the chair was referring to. Analysis shows that two-thirds of the cost of the tax reductions that you've announced, albeit within a, an envelope that's rising, are actually financed by borrowing. Why did you decide that you could cut taxes and finance two-thirds of those cuts by borrowing rather than raising other revenue elsewhere? Well, that's not how I describe what I did at all. And uh, the only way that you get that number is by taking five years. I took the six years, including the current year, uh, that uh, I was talking about at the autumn statement. And the Office of Budget Responsibility confirmed that if you take those, the full six years, uh, borrowing has not gone up. In fact, it's gone down very slightly. Well, that's because your rule says it has to in the rolling fifth year of the program, but borrowing goes up to pay for the front end load of tax cuts, which are conveniently ahead of the general election. Um, but it but it doesn't actually come down until the very, very end of that period, does it? It's rather a convenient fiscal rule from that point of view. Oh, um, the reason why it's important is because those cuts in national insurance are going to add 1% to people's living standards after a cost of living crisis, that really matters. Uh, because of that decision, partly because of that decision, the OBR upgraded their forecast for growth next year by 0.5%. Um, I think that's a pretty good thing for the country when we are emerging from a, a technical recession to see additional growth. I think that's very good for people who are families <coughs> who are struggling in a cost of living crisis. But over the period, um, borrowing uh, is broadly the same. In fact, it comes down to I mean, the, the analysis, again, the experts of whom we, we saw yesterday shows that um, you would fail to meet three out of the four of your Tory predecessors' fiscal rules, uh, those that have been in, in, um, in operation since 2010, and that this is, in fact, a rule that's very loose and... and, and implies because it doesn't distinguish between capital investment spending and spending on current um, issues that it keeps making it easy for capital expenditure to be cut which our experts you have read if you've you read uh, yesterday's sessions uh, were very critical of why have you failed to meet 
three out of four of your Conservative predecessors' fiscal rules Let's take and both. Um, put into place a fiscal rule that actually discourages capital investment when we need to retool the entire country for preparation for net zero. Well, your own party did not object when I changed the fiscal rules, and rightly. And the reason they didn't object is because, unlike the vast majority of my predecessor chancellors, I have had to deal with the aftermath of a once-in-a-century pandemic and a 1970s-style energy shock, which is an utterly exceptional situation, as the distinguished economist that you heard from yesterday recognised. And if I had stuck with tighter fiscal rules in that context, I would have had to do an even bigger consolidation than I had to do in the autumn statement of 22, which would have choked even more growth out of the economy, whether it was through spending cuts or tax rises. And I don't believe we would have the, the healthy growth prospects that I was able to announce last week, which basically say that by the end of next year, we're getting back to 2% growth a year, which is a, a world apart from where we've been for the last couple of years. So that's why I think it was the right thing to change the fiscal rules in the way that I did. In terms of capital spending... Yeah, I wanted uh, yeah. to come on to that. Shall I answer your important. question on that? Because yeah. um, uh, the Prime Minister, when he was in my job, uh, increased capital spending by 20% in real terms in the spending review of 2020, the biggest ever increase in capital spending. Um, and uh, I have preserved... I think it's very important. I agree with uh, the argument that investment, both public investment and private investment, is very important for growth. And that was why um, I did not do what uh, previous chancellors have done uh, when faced with a financial crunch, which is cut capital spending cash terms. I wasn't able to protect it in real terms. Um, I would like to continue to support capital spending uh, going forward. And in fact, the, uh, the £3.4 billion pounds NHS investment is additional capital spending. Um, but I think uh, in the circumstances that was a proportionate thing to do. In uh, evidence of the Lords Economic Affairs Committee, Richard Hughes, who heads the OBR, as we all know, um, said it was generous to call your spending plans a work of fiction. Uh, why haven't you been able to provide more certainty on your future spending plans, given that you've used a lot of the money that's made a lot of choices actually to cut taxes with those uh, with the money foregone in the future for departmental spending. Well, he didn't say that yesterday. Um, and the comments, the earlier comments that he made were ahead of the budget. And the budget had a very lengthy section uh, which explained what our approach to the spending assumption will be um, in a way that is designed to avoid austerity style cuts in public services that are valued by uh, the public. And what are we going to do? Well, we're going to launch uh, the biggest ever public sector productivity program, um, starting with the NHS, which is about 40% of public expenditure, which the NHS themselves independently assess means that they will be able to increase their productivity by 1.9% uh, a year over the five, five years ahead. Um, our intention is to replicate that across all public services. The OBR say that if you deliver that, uh, that would, uh, and, and, and you turn it into a cashable saving, and that is an if because it's a challenge to do that, but you can make 20 billion pounds of savings. Uh, and that way, I think we will be able to make those very tight uh, real terms increases in public spending sustainable. Finally, the OBR stated that meeting existing commitments on health, defence, schools, childcare and overseas aid spending would imply a real terms cut in all other departments budgets of 2.3%. That also includes for local authorities, one in ten of whom are quite close to bankruptcy at the moment. How are those kinds of cuts, which are implied by these figures, ever going to be realised in reality? Well, if you modernise the way public services are delivered, um, as we are, and we've announced very detailed plans to do that for the NHS, um, you can get a 2% a year increase in productivity, 
which um, addresses the majority of uh, those mooted cuts in spending in unprotected departments. Thank you. Thank you. Because I think your own red book says that output from public services is still 5.9% lower than before the pandemic. Is that is correct. That correct? Uh, Siobhan. Oh, thank you. Um, can I just uh, uncharacteristically say something nice to you? Uh, I shall uh, enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, thank you for abolishing the fee on the debt management order. We've spoken on the committee about the appropriateness of IBAs and debt management orders for people uh, on low incomes in debt. So that's going to be a good move for some people in a really hard space. Um, and following that, in November 2022, shortly before becoming Chancellor, uh, when asked about the non-DOM tax loophole, you said, I'm not going to do anything that's going to damage the long-term attractiveness of the UK, even though it gives easy, easy shots to opposition parties. I think it would be wrong to do things in terms of, create, in terms of creating jobs in the UK. What made you do your big 360-degree U-turn? Well, I actually haven't changed my position on that. I don't want to do anything that is damaging to the competitiveness, competitiveness of, of the UK. My view... Non-DOM tax yeah, loophole. Exactly. Um, I, I resisted doing anything at that stage. I think I've been Chancellor for uh, just a few weeks when I made that comment. And I was very concerned about the um, potential risks to investment in the UK, which I think is the single biggest thing that we need to sort out if we're going to grow the economy. Um, but I did look into the issue because I don't think that there is any uh, justification as to why anyone should pay a cheque and not pay the same tax as everyone else. So I looked into it. I had detailed discussions with experts in the field. And I think I've come up with a a program that will not be damaging to UK competitiveness and investment in the economy and that's why I announced Were you wrong in plans. November 2022? I, I wasn't wrong because I said then as you quoted at me that I was not prepared to do anything that was damaging to Which competitiveness. Which was about closing yeah, the, and I, well, the I was not tax loophole. Well I wasn't going to rush into a policy until I had properly but got to the bottom of how one well, could. You did say that closing that loophole would mean losing jobs in the UK and that's really not the case is it? Well, that was my concern and that but I needed to take some time it's a very complex area of tax policy um, and I needed to take some time and I've taken that time what, and I think it, I've come up with a plan that... Was it, was it the same reason that you decided to extend the windfall tax on North Sea oil producers because you said about extending it only a year ago stopping invest it would stop investment stop dependence on Putin and increase energy prices? I do think that's what would happen if we follow the Labour Party policies with respect to North Sea oil and gas, yes, because um, by getting rid of the allowances for investors in the North Sea, um, I think investment would uh, dry up completely and that would increase our uh, energy dependence when we should be trying to be energy independent, would increase prices for consumers. But that's not what I've done. What I've done is recognise something has changed since we originally introduced the energy profits levy. What's which next? VAT um, on, on private Could, student fees? Uh, no, uh, that is not Because next. Rachel uh, Reeves clearly seems um, to be... Can, um, I, can I answer your, your question, guru? though, Dame Siobhan? Because yeah. um, what has changed is, compared to uh, 2022, is an understanding that the war in Ukraine is likely to last much longer than people originally thought at the time, and that, therefore, some of the higher prices that are creating unexpected profits for some energy companies are also likely to last longer. And so in that context, given that taxpayers have had to spend £94 billion in cost of living support for families to help people with higher energy prices amongst other increases, I thought it was reasonable to increase the energy profits levy tax by £1.5 billion. My worry is that you're going to start looking to Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng in order to uh, meet your desire to abolish national insurance and give us £46 billion worth of unfunded uh, tax cuts. Um, or are you just planning to scrap the state retirement pension altogether to meet that target? 
Well, it can't be the case that I'm both following Labour policy and following no. Liz Truss's <laughs> policy at the same time. Um, you know, it's 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 got to be one or the other. But um, let's be let's be let's talk about the uh, uh, the announcement that we made that we want to abolish the double tax on work. And first of all, um, the amount of money raised by national insurance does not determine the amount of money going into the state pension or the NHS. Um, it hasn't done for very many decades. Um, and the evidence for that is the budget, because the budget, we announced a £6 billion increase in funding for the NHS. And we announced a £900 increase in the state pension, which is going up by 8.5%, which is uh, around three times the rate of inflation. Um, can I say this, though? If I believed that cutting national insurance uh, was going to be something that would mean cutting funding for the NHS, I would vote against it. And what is interesting to me is that Labour have been putting out this story today um, but they are supporting the cuts in national insurance. And I'm just wondering how it is that Labour MPs can square with their conscience voting in favour of a cut in national insurance at the same time as they're trying to scare everyone that it will mean cuts in funding for the NHS. Um, on a really serious issue, the one that's most important to me in terms of my constituents, um, and which you had so no. little to say on in the budget, housing. Uh, we've got 104,510 families, including 142,490 children living in temporary accommodation at a cost of £1.6 billion. But worse than the money that we're throwing away in that direction are that we've discovered that 55 children died between 2019 and 23 as a result of living in temporary accommodation. 42 of them were under the age of one. The coroner's reports ruled that their accommodation had a very significant impact on their death and for the ones under one, it was probably almost entirely because they didn't have access to a flat, to a, a cot. Um, would you agree with me that that gives this country a sense of shame? And what can you do to build more social housing units? Well, um, I first of all recognise that we need to build more houses. So I very much agree with you on that. And without, you know, trading party politics, as you've been uh, more reasonable this afternoon than. than uh, uh, perhaps I was expecting, and very unfairly so, but it, without doing that, I would just point out that in terms of the number of houses built in the last year for which we have records, uh, it's actually higher than were built under any year of the previous Labour government, and we need to do even better than that. Um, so uh, that's why we've introduced planning reforms, that's why we've got big plans to develop housing in well, Cambridge. We've got housing targets. London. Hang on, can I just finish? Cambridge, London and Leeds. Well, the outcome is what matters and the outcome is that we have built houses at a greater rate. We're on track to build a million additional houses this Parliament. Um, so that is a, a substantial uplift on what's happened under previous governments. But we need to do more. I fully accept that. Um, this budget, I would have liked to have had some measures that help people get on the housing ladder. But it is difficult to do that unless you are absolutely confident that property prices are back on the up, because otherwise you are encouraging people to get onto the housing ladder uh, with the prospect of house prices falling and therefore them falling into negative equity. So I didn't judge that it was the right time for those kinds of measures. But is that something I would like to return to of future fiscal events, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Siobhan. Stephen. John, so good afternoon. Um, you said many times that this is a tax-cutting budget and it was a budget that was going to lead to growth. We've obviously spoken about already, and you've answered some questions on the national insurance. Could you just lay out the other measures in the budget that you think support those claims? Yes. Um, well, let's, uh, the, there's a lot of things that support growth in the budget, um, so let me try and be succinct. Um, first of all, uh, there was a very big focus on our fastest growing industries, which are the ones that I think provide the biggest opportunity for us as a country going forward, particularly technology-linked industries, 
um, the creative industries had a billion pounds of tax relief for film and TV production, where we've become the biggest film and TV production centre in Europe. Uh, for technology startups, where we have more than anywhere else in Europe, um, we made some <coughs> very big steps in unlocking pension fund capital, which will mean that uh, with more liquidity, they're able to uh, not just get capital here in the UK, but ultimately list in the UK, which at the moment many of them uh, are inclined not to. Um, when it comes to life sciences, we were able to announce a uh, £650 million investment by AstraZeneca in a new vaccines manufacturing hub in Speak in Liverpool. So there was lots of focus on the most rapidly growing industries. But um, the, the other thing that, uh, apart from sort of tax cuts that themselves were targeted at growth, there were other measures to help companies get the labour they need, um, in particular publishing the uh, childcare rates for the next two years to encourage investment by the childcare sector because we're going to need about 170,000 <coughs> extra childcare places because of the childcare reforms I announced a year ago. One of the micro measures, which I think probably may well prove to be one of the most significant, was the move in VAT threshold. Uh, and certainly for a lot of my constituents who are sole traders and all of that. Can you say what benefit you've, you've calculated that to be to the overall growth level? Um, I think it's going to mean that tens of thousands of companies, small companies, are taken out of paying VAT altogether. Um, and um, other companies that uh, were hovering just below the £85,000 threshold uh, will feel less constrained to grow higher. But, um, you know, it is, it's, a, it's a difficult uh, thing moving that threshold because there is going to be a cliff edge wherever you put the threshold, but where it's possible to do something, I think you should. Much as uh, there's been a widely quoted statement which has been quoted again today that at the end of this Parliament... Uh, the tax burden will be the highest it's been, um, significantly higher than the highest since World War II. Can I ask you four questions about it? Firstly, um, clearly the element of fiscal drag is significant in that in 21-22 there'll be 4.3 million higher rates tax holders, uh, taxpayers, uh, eight years later 7.3. The OBR forecasts that a number of the measures that have happened in the budget are fall into similar vein in terms of the result of higher tax VAT returns. Can you comment on how much of the ambition is the government to look at those measures which are not policy changes which are affecting the tax burden? And, f and can I also just say, in terms of that statement, is it also not true that the percentage tax burden actually only started to rise significantly from 2020? And if you look at the 10 years before that, uh, as a percentage of tax take, um, the tax burden was actually pretty flat, if not falling in the year before uh, 2020. I think that's right, um, and that is um, because obviously we had the cost of the pandemic and the energy shock and the high inflation. Um, so uh, let's just talk about fiscal drag for a moment. Um, it is true that that is one of the principal ways that tax has gone up to pay down that COVID debt. Um, of course, and the reason why it has increased the tax take is because of inflation, which pushes up salaries, pushes up prices, and then brings more people into higher tax bands. Um, but since the autumn statement, the inflation projections have actually come down, and that means that the take, the tax take, is actually t was about £12 billion less than predicted at the autumn statement. So that goes both ways. But I think for someone on the average salary of about £35,000, um, if you just say what will happen next year, uh, the freezing of the thresholds means that they will pay just over £230 more than they would have if we had uprated the thresholds mm. with inflation. The national insurance cuts mean they'll pay £900 less. So um, it is a significant cut in the tax burden and overall if you take the four fiscal events I've been responsible for, two budgets and two autumn statements, even including the tax rises that I announced in my first autumn statement, those measures reduce the tax burden by 0.6% of GDP. Um, can we just, the, one of the other statements you've made quite often uh, I think 
during your speech last week and subsequently is that you want to see a simplification of the tax system. On balance, do you think this budget has simplified or made the tax system more complex? Um, I think it's made it simpler. Um, but I know it's a particular passion of the chairs to simplify the all tax. Of us, all yes. of us. <laughs> um, it's a passion I share. Um, and so um, I've, I've made a commitment to this committee that I would always make sure there was one tax simplification measure. Um, the biggest one uh, probably is what uh, I was discussing with Dame Siobhan, which is the change on non-DOMs, which is a, an incredibly outdated complex system. We are getting rid of the concept of domicile in the tax system and moving to a residence-based system, which is much simpler and much fairer. I was about to ask you where you were on that consultation, so I think you've answered that question. Uh, when do you think these measures will be enacted on non-DOMs? Um, from April 2025. And given uh, the, the chairman's, and I suspect all of our liking for tax simplification, shouldn't we have an office for tax simplification now? Mm. Okay. Um, well, um, reinstate it. Yeah. Uh, look, I think you know the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and I think I have <laughs> simplified taxes in every fiscal event that I've done. Um, and you, can you might not be there forever, Chancellor, and so we'd like a permanent I, simplification I, of the tax code. I don't know what you're suggesting. No. I'm hoping well, to be I'm, here for a very long time indeed. Uh, but, well, we, uh, hope, we hope so as well, but that's a different... <laughs> Thank you. But I, I, I would say that, you know, even if the Office for Tax Simplification were uh, beavering away coming up with suggestions, in the end it would need a political decision by a Chancellor to accept those decisions. And ultimately, you know, if we... Um, abolish the double tax on work, which is what the Conservative Party wants to do over time. It won't happen in one parliament, but it's a long-term ambition. If we do that, that will be uh, the biggest tax simplification in our lifetimes. And you obviously had stated in the budget last week your ambition to, in, to remove the double taxation on work as a simplification. Do you regard that as uh, a long-term policy uh, ambition or a policy commitment for the next Parliament? The former. And therefore, some of the discussion about the £46 billion becomes somewhat irrelevant because the number may change. And as you said earlier, it wouldn't affect either the funding of state pension, the welfare state or the National Health Service. Correct. And in fact, I was very explicit uh, when I announced that long-term ambition that it would not be funded by cuts to public services or uh, by borrowing, um, but it would be a long-term commitment, just as our long-term commitment to increase the personal tax threshold first announced in 2010 uh, when it was about £6,500, got to £12,500 12 years later in 2022. So that was a long-term commitment. It's perfectly possible to deliver these commitments over time if it's something that you really want to do and in this case the impact on growth would be very very positive um, which is why you know I think Torsten Bell said yesterday it would be a better world if you could do that although in fairness he was skeptical that we would get there but you know he, thought, he said it was the right direction of travel. Thank you Stephen. Good afternoon Chancellor. Um, first of all can I commend you for continuing to oversee an economy which has record employment and an unemployment rate around a third less than the EU average. And I'd ask you to continue to well, not be afraid of reminding people that taxation is a little higher than we would like, but it's for a good reason that we left nobody behind during COVID or indeed during this cost of living crisis. I think that sometimes is forgotten by some. Um, as someone who has always believed that national insurance is a tax on jobs and voted accordingly when there's been proposals to increase national insurance, can I put to you that, and I'd be interested in the extent to which you think this is true, that actually the, the budget, your budget, was quite radical in the sense that it's moving, it's, and together with the autumn statement, it's looking to move the tax burden from workers to most the forms, if not all forms, all other forms of income, whether they be pensions or savings. And that has got to be good if we're going to ensure that we retain an economy 
that has strong employment prospects, and it bodes well going forward with growth over the longer term. Would you agree with that? Broadly, yes. But I would say, for example, to pensioners that uh, we have taken a great deal of care with our support, for example, for the triple lock to uh, make sure that we look after pensioners. And I think that uh, Torsten Bell confirmed yesterday that when you take into account policy changes on size of pension, mm -hmm. tax cuts, they're a £1,000 a year better off than they were in 2010. Mm -hmm. um, but the way I would put it is this. We want to look after pensioners. They are incredibly important. They have uh, built the society that we now benefit from. Um, but if they want us to continue to uh, be giving record increases in the state pension, then we need to grow the economy. And we need to focus our tax cuts on the things that will most grow the economy. And that means getting more people into work. But you would accept that we have used national insurance contributions in the past, increases, to fund public services. This signals a reversal in that approach, but not necessarily it's the wrong decision is what I'm suggesting. I mean, I think it's many decades since uh, there was a, a link between the funding for the NHS or, or pensions and, and the money that goes into national insurance. I think now it is effectively treated as just another tax pot. Um, and all these different tax pots have an impact on behaviour. Mm -hmm. And if you have one that disincentivizes work, it is holding back economic growth, and that is the wrong thing. May I turn to a subject that you and I and the Economic Secretary have been discussing, uh, and I here I refer to my entry in the register with regards to um, investment trusts, um, otherwise known as investment companies. I mean, you will be aware that we have a disclosure problem, cost disclosure problem here. Um, investment trusts make up something like 40%, nearly 40% of FTSE 250 companies, and there's a number of them that are FTSE 100 companies. Now a quirk, and I know you understand this, a quirk of EU retained law, which the EU itself has since legislated away, away requires British in investment trusts to combine their corporate and their investment management costs or on the ENT feeds used by investors. This is important because this double counting uniquely makes British investment trusts look unduly expensive, and so investors are shunning these British companies, discounts have widened, and investment trust, or investment I should say, into sectors such as renewable energy and infrastructure has completely dried up. Previously, investment trusts were a conduit by way of tens of billions of pounds into these sectors which are good for the economy. In fact, British companies are now buying up their own shares to close the discounts, and that is withdrawing money from the sector. My question is this. The autumn statement produced one draft SI relating to PRIPs, um, which, with a promise of another to follow, over 300 members of the London Stock Exchange, including many investment houses, responded to the SI's consultation, which closed in January. When will the legislation come before Parliament, and when can we expect the accompanying MIFID SI? Um, I will uh, write to you with more detailed answers on those, if I may, Mr. Barron. But um, let me put it this way: um, you know, we are having discussions at the moment on the best way forward. We are completely committed to removing uh, PRIPs and replacing them with something better. We understand fully the concerns of the investment trust community about the situation that we're in right now and we are working out the best way forward. But because it's market sensitive, because these are quoted companies, um, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to go into detail about precisely what our thinking is. I, I hope you understand that. I do understand that. What I'd ask in return is for you to understand perhaps the urgency, and I think you do, of the situation, because I would suggest to you that more immediate action is required, because British companies are now, at this very moment, toying with listing abroad, courtesy of this issue. And important sectors to this economy are seeing no investment or future. Can I suggest this to you in your deliberations and, in, and discussions more generally? that the government fast-tracks legislation 
which reflects the consultation response of the 300 plus members of the London Stock Exchange, which called for investment companies to be removed from the CCI, the Consumer Composite Investment Regime, because this at a stroke would end the double counting issue on the EMT feeds, and then they'd be back on a level playing field with many foreign companies. I mean, given the FCA believes that legislation is required, and in its forbearance, it has gone as far as it believes it can, will the government now legislate accordingly? Well, for the reasons I've just said, um, I'm, not, I'm not going to answer that question, I'm afraid, because we're in the middle of making those decisions, but uh, your concerns are very well noted. Okay. Finally, if I may, on this issue, the consultation on the PRIPS SI closed in January, and we're now waiting for it to come before Parliament. There is not yet a draft MIFID SI, which has also been promised in the autumn statement, which will probably also require a consultation. We then, once these SIs go through Parliament, the FCA will have to internalise what the legislation says, run its own consultation for several months and consider the responses before producing its solution. This all takes time and we're looking at probably at the end of the year for, this to, for anything meaningful to come out of this process. I mean, I just leave you with this sense. I'm not expecting any more of an answer, but can I just impress this on you, that this timetable does not match the urgency. Um, investment companies are alarmed that unless action is taken quickly, there will soon not be much of the sector left. And in line with your budget speech last week, I would prefer, and I'm sure you would as well, British investors to invest in these great British companies but they may not yet be around for too much longer. Solving this problem, I put to you, shouldn't cost the Treasury a penny. It's simply a question of the cost disclosure regime. May I leave that with you? You certainly may. If I may just gently say that I think the pace of reforms uh, that we have introduced to make the city more competitive with the Edinburgh reforms, the Mansion House reforms, what I announced at the autumn statement, what I announced in the budget, has been unprecedented. So we are absolutely determined to proceed at pace with all those reforms and we are absolutely committed to making our financial service sector globally competitive. I would share that sentiment and I agree with in very large respect to what you say, but when it comes to investment trust there is a specific issue that the system has failed to acknowledge with regards to the cost disclosure regime which you could put right very quickly. But that's all I would say about that. I hear what you say. And the committee will continue to try to encourage that urgency um, uh, and give power to your uh, elbow on that with uh, the, the people we scrutinise. Thank you. Uh, Keir. Wonderful. Thank you very much for coming, Chancellor. Um, you've obviously been around this place a lot longer than I have, uh, served in multiple Conservative governments since 2010. Do you feel like you've got a good story to tell after 14 years in power? Yes, I do. I do wonder, you said in the budget that you'd turned a corner when it came to growth, but I do wonder why it's taken you 14 years to turn that corner. Analysis from the Resolution Foundation has shown that since 2010 we've had GDP per capita growth of just 0.8% a year, average wages have risen by just 0.2%, that's the slowest growth during any average party's period in office since World War II. Is that really a record on growth to be proud of? I think it is when you look at the context that we've come through. And so, first of all, let me say that when I said we turned a corner, I was talking about the, uh, the recent reduction in growth caused by the high interest rates to tackle the high inflation caused by the invasion of Ukraine. Um, but if you look at the record on growth since 2010, uh, we've grown faster than uh, the largest three European economies and countries like Japan. Um, and the IMF say we will grow faster than France, Germany and Italy over the next five years as well. Um, of course, growth in that period uh, has been more subdued than it was before the financial crisis. The financial crisis was a shock that has suppressed growth rates all over the world. And um, you know, without wanting to be party political, um, you know, public finances were shot to pieces when the government came into power in 2010. So... We had to do a huge job in repairing public finances and took some very, very difficult decisions. Um, but when it comes to GDP per head, um, it has risen faster than countries like Norway, the Netherlands, France, 
Finland, Canada. Um, I think it's very respectable performance. Um, but if we want it to grow faster, and this was the theme of the budget, um, then we have to tackle our long-standing productivity issues. That means boosting investment, and that was why we introduced the uh, capital allowances regime, the most generous in, in the world, uh, in the autumn statement. Well, not to be past political in return, but if wage growth had continued at the same rate that it was in 2008, we'd all be around 14 grand better off. And it seems an interesting strain in conservative thinking that when you weather economic events and take credit for them, so say when inflation returns to target later this year, that's definitely one of the Prime Minister's achievements that should be chalked up. But all these other headwinds that have prevented you from making progress seem to be sort of swept aside. Is there not any way in which decision making from successive conservative governments that you've served in over the last well, decade and a half, have contributed to some of the, the mess that we find ourselves in presently? Well, you can't magic away a global financial crisis. It was an absolutely huge moment um, and had a profound economic impact on all developed countries. And I think in some ways we're still seeing the consequences of those. Um, and in the wake of that, we had to take some very, very difficult decisions uh, to get the economy back on its feet. Um, I don't pretend that uh, we've got every single decision right. Um, I was on the back benches for uh, nearly three years uh, before I became <laughs> Chancellor, so I've made many comments on written books on which talk about some of the things that we, we've learned from that and some of the things we didn't get right. But I think overall uh, we've grown faster than other similar economies in Europe. We're predicted to grow faster going forward, and we have a good plan to close the productivity gap with countries like uh, Germany and America, uh, which will lead to an increase in uh, living standards, GDP per head, which is, I think, what we all want. I'd like to explore your thinking on what you think the drivers of growth are a bit more, because you don't strike me as you know, a sort of dogmatic Tory and being wedded to ideology overly. Do you think that... Not the amount he listens to Rachel Reeves, anyway. In, well, in, but in terms of sort of efficient... But I, thought, I thought I was in the shadow of Liz Truss a moment ago, mm. don't you, Vaughan? Well, we can all be in multiple shadows. Maybe you're a bit, a bit, a bit Catholic in, in your shadows. view. Oh, Order. <laughs> I just wonder your view. Do you think, yes, efficient, but fundamentally well-resourced public services set a foundation upon which the UK achieves economic growth? Yes. I wonder how that squares, though, with some of the questions that Dame Angela asked you earlier when we're set to endure a 13% reduction in real capita day-to-day -day spending for unprotected departments. Does that not erode those departments' ability to provide the well-funded and resourced public services to deliver the sort of growth we need? It would if they delivered services in the same way that they deliver them now. It won't if they transform the way they deliver those services. And that, let me just... I will, yeah. I promise you, uh, give you a chance to uh, ask me fully. And by the way, I very much respect the tone in which you're asking these questions, um, but I think that is the, if I may say without sounding too much of a grandfather, that's exactly the right way <laughs> that I select, select, select committees should, for. okay, without sounding patronising, I think it's <laughs> the way that select committees should work. But, um, uh, so, if you look at the NHS, for example, where um, I think we will need to give, uh, in continued increases in funding going forward because of the ageing population, the increasing demands on the NHS. Uh, we need to transform the way the NHS delivers its services. Even its strongest supporters, of whom I consider myself one, would say that there are parts of the NHS that are woefully inefficient and we need to transform that. And the £3.4 billion that we committed to digitise the way the NHS is, uh, operates, for example, Digitising operating theatres means we'll be able to do about 200,000 more operations a year with the same number of consultants. That is a transformation in the way the NHS runs that will make it amongst the most efficient healthcare services in the world. That's the same transformation that I want to see in the police, the courts, local government, uh, and we announced some funding for that, but I would like to 
get more plans from those departments and we would be willing to give more funding going forward. Yeah, the thing is though, Chancellor, I see your logic, but it does strike me in a sense as wishful thinking. I get the argument that you increase efficiencies in public service delivery and therefore the bill that you would ask to pay isn't as great and therefore the reductions don't have to be as severe. I get that. But you called for a paperless NHS, what was it, in 2013. We're close to a decade later and it's not been delivered. And I would say that lots of people don't have faith in your ability to deliver these efficiencies. In that context, those public services will have to find those spending cuts. And it could be absolutely devastating for the, ability to, for the UK's ability to get back onto that growth trajectory that we need. I totally understand. Pol politicians have been promising efficiency and productivity improvements uh, for, for years and years. Um, but I don't think you have to believe me. Um, the head of the NHS, who is completely independent, says that on the back of the investment she, uh, that we have committed to in the budget, the NHS will be able to deliver productivity improvements of 1.9% a year. Um, if I may, just in, my, in terms of my own record in the NHS, um, I didn't get the NHS completely paperless. It is absolutely true. I made the promise in I think, 2012 and I said, I hope by 2018 it would be. But we did make enormous progress, including putting the funding in place for the NHS app, which was actually launched just a few minutes, a few months after I stopped being health secretary, which I think has been completely transformative and played a very important role in the pandemic. So I think the NHS has made good progress. Um, they think they can do it. The, um, the OBR say, I think Richard Hughes said yesterday, that we've had productivity plans in the past and they have succeeded. And I suppose the, the real proof of the pudding is that between 2010 and 2019, before the pandemic started, we were getting, on average, public sector productivity improvements of 0.7% a year. Um, we want to be more ambitious than that, but it's, <coughs> it's not impossible to get good productivity improvements, and that's what we're determined to do. Turning then to a separate part of the, the growth puzzle, do you believe that market confidence is fundamental to setting the stability upon which UK economic growth is achieved? In, sorry, market confidence in the government's fiscal policy. It is important because um, we need to attract investment. And that is, uh, you know, public sector and private sector, but public sector you have control of. Private sector, um, you know, you're, these are decisions made by independent investment, so in, independent investors. But it's also important for public sector investment because if the markets don't have confidence, your debt interest will be more expensive. So I presume, based on the tone of those comments, you wouldn't sort of follow the example of your predecessor, you know, defy the OBR's assessment of fiscal policy, go, go ahead heedless and wreak economic consequences for the economy that are uh, negative. In fact, I reversed uh, nearly all of the policies of my predecessor in my first few weeks as Chancellor. Do not think it could be said, though, that in a sense you, you've, you've done one worse in regard to the mooted abolition of NIC contributions altogether? Because not only have you not told the OBR that that was something that you're interested in doing, by not telling them, they're not even able to forecast what the potential impact of that economic choice could be. It strikes me with this entire debate around scrapping the contributions that it's either you know, a passion project of yours and it's to be set aside on the back burner, or it's a serious policy which you told Conservative members in an email a couple of days ago that you would make progress on in the next Parliament. If that's the case, shouldn't the OBR be able to forecast the impact of the policy to give the markets the confidence they, ha they, they need that you're a sure hand in the tiller of the UK economy? No, um, and I don't think you have to take my word on it. I think uh, you should listen to what Torsten Bell said when he said this was uh, absolutely... Uh, no comparison with what happened in the mini budget and the reason is very straightforward because we're not putting a timeline on it we've been very clear this is a long-term ambition uh, to uh, make work pay in the British economy it's the right thing for economic growth it'll be the work of many parliaments and uh, we will make progress but only when it's affordable to do so uh, when we can do so because the economy is growing and we won't do so at the expense of public services we won't do so by borrowing but the evidence that we're committed to doing this is the fact that we managed to take 2p off national insurance in the budget and 2p in the autumn statement. If I, if I might just come in, um, Chair, in addition to what the Chancellor had to say, I think Mr Mather is referring to what the Chairman of the OBR had to say, I think in response to Dame Angela yesterday, that the, the, the commitment was not given to the OBR as a measure to cost in the mm. EFO, and that's quite right. 
the next policy given to the OBR to cost in the economic and fiscal outlook is the further 2p reduction in um, employee and self-employed national insurance. That's a certified costing in the OBR document because that's the policy the government has um, set out. Thank you. And I think we've also got the opportunity to vote on it uh, later today if we disagree with it. Um, I shall be supporting it. Um, uh, Danny. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Chancellor, you, you will have read in the transcript from yesterday that Paul Johnson and Torsten Bell uh, and our other witnesses, in fact, all, all said the concern about how precise the debt target is and the forecasting obligations on the OBR relevant to that have all sorts of slightly pernicious consequences, not least for our, our debates um, and, and for your work. They they felt that the, the, the rule is... Uh, is, is both too loose but also invites this very precise predictions and they were suggesting that actually a better system would be a more qualitative target that you should be that you should set out a intention on debt and they should be invited to see how uh, the government is doing on that would you welcome a, a slightly less prescriptive target that was still it still sets the direction of travel but doesn't uh, mean that you're having to conform exactly to a, to a number? Well, I read that suggestion with great interest, um, and I, I will reflect on it, but I, I have to say, much as I respect the, the individuals who are saying that, that I'm struggling to see how that could actually work in practice. Um, and I think the, the reality is that in fiscal rules, you are trying to balance two objectives and you want to make progress on both of them but they can also conflict with each other mm. one of them is that you want to have a credible path to reducing debt and the other is you don't want to constrain investment that's important for the long-term growth of the economy and I think we you know we the, no fiscal rule is perfect but the structures that we have at the moment do mean that there is a guardrail which means that um, you know, I have to show discipline in terms of debt reduction, but they also give me the latitude to take decisions that will increase growth in the, the five years running up to that, that fifth year where you have that uh, debt reduction rule. So you don't accept Dawson Bell's suggestion that a commitment to have debt falling in five years is a, is a commitment never to have debt falling at all because you can always push it out? Um, well, I think, you know, in the end, if... Uh, if you were to constantly do that, you know, the markets would find you out. But I think the markets themselves also want to see that you are investing sensibly. I think what they would also say, I don't know if they actually said this yesterday, but certainly I think it's what uh, my officials at the Treasury would say, is that um, a lot of the credibility of your fiscal rules is actually about the policies that you pursue within the five-year cycle. So if, if markets sense that you've got sensible policies that are going to enhance growth, like the national insurance cuts that bring more people into the workforce, if they can see that you've got a sensible plan to boost investment in the economy, uh, then they recognise that you're more likely to be a country that's good for your debt in the future. Okay, thank you. One measure that I really welcomed in the budget was the lifting of the VAT threshold. Um, only 5,000 pounds however but the direction travel very welcome is it the case that that was only it was only raised by five thousand pounds because of concerns around northern ireland and our obligations to uh maintain a uh, you know a single vat regime for the whole of the uk and are you content with that uh that constraint imposed by our agreement with the eu would you like to have gone further if it wasn't for that um, that was the most that we could afford. It was a very, very tight settlement. Um, I wanted to do something because you and many other people had argued for it. Um, and uh, long, yeah. pe lots of people would have liked a much bigger increase, but, but that was the most we could afford. Not, it, wasn't, it wasn't Northern Ireland related at all, then? It is true that there are no issues with the Windsor framework at the level that we made the increase, but the reason that we chose that number is because um, it is the most we could afford. Great, thank you. A quick question on the high-income high trial benefit charge. Again, very much welcome the raising of the threshold. You've, you've eliminated a really pernicious uh, uh, cliff edge there for a lot of families. Really welcome. Do, w would you like to have gone further and scrapped the charge altogether? Do you think that would be the right thing to do long term? Uh, or do you think it is necessary to have a, a means test of some sort? Um, 
And secondly, also welcome the commitment to have a household basis for assessment on this. Do you think that that model can be applied more generally in tax policy or does it only apply in the case of the, uh, the child benefit charge? I think when you have constrained resources, it is right that there is a clawback of benefits like child benefit for people at higher income levels. But I don't think the way it works at the moment is at all satisfactory. I think it's very unfair to uh, single earner households and um, and it creates a, a big work disincentive. So um, we've been able to make some improvement, but I want to see whether there's a, a much fairer system that can reflect household income in the way that the benefit system does. And if we can find a solution uh, that works, then that could potentially be a solution to uh, problems we have with other things like childcare, which are also based on uh, one person in the household earning more than £100,000. But I think the first thing I want to see is see whether we can do this at all. There are people who have profound objections to HMRC collecting data on a household level, so I want to test parliamentary opinion on that. Um, and see if there's a way we can solve it for child benefit before right. we consider other steps. Okay. Well, it's very, very welcome. And uh, in, the, in, in further pursuit of your hero, Nigel Lawson, I would encourage you to fulfil the original uh, intention of individual taxation, which was to allow for uh, household assessment. Where, where families wanted. Yeah, alongside abolishing non-doms, which was another of Nigel Lawson's Is that right? policy, which very, I think maybe the good. Labour Party copied. Hooray, hooray for Nigel. Well, you <laughs> Um, lastly, Chancellor, on defence. So uh, I, it's a very important commitment that the government has to fund defence at a level of 2.5%. We're a NATO leader in that regard, and I, I wish we could hear from the Labour Party that they were also going to match that commitment. Uh, but I think we need to go further, and I wonder whether you do. Uh, we've heard the aspiration to scrap national insurance when funding allows. I'd like to hear from you what your personal view is on the long-term future of defence funding in this country. And when I say long-term, I mean actually fairly immediate term, given the challenges that our country and our world faces at the moment. And I'd like to understand whether the decision not to fund defence further, and I know there was a small uplift, I think less than 1% in the budget, um, uh, the decision not to go further than that was because you couldn't afford it or because you think it's not necessary at this time. Um, I well, don't perhaps think the defence can't take the money because there is this argument about they can't, they couldn't receive too much money at once. But it, no, what is the I, I wouldn't use I, any of those explanations. Actually, um, I do believe we will need to spend more on defence. I think the world is becoming more dangerous. I think it's patently evident that uh, Russia and China want to upend the international order that has brought more peace and prosperity to the world than any other in the existence of humanity. And uh, this is a period in history where we cannot take for granted our democratic freedoms, uh, very sadly. Um, but uh, and that's why we made our commitment to uh, moving to two and a half percent of GDP as soon as we can afford to do so. Um, I think we have already done a lot um, in the budget last year. I increased defence spending by 11 billion. I think in the autumn statement by that it was just under half a billion, and before that. The Prime Minister, when he was Chancellor, uh, £24 billion increase. So there have been some significant increases, and it is increasing by about half a percent a year in real terms. So there is a significant increase going on. Before we go further, I think that we need to fully understand whether we have made sufficient reforms to defence procurement, which is, I know, something the Defence Secretary is very involved with and has been very active on. Um, and we also need to fully understand the implications of the war in Ukraine on the type of thing we would need to invest in for the wars of the future. So those are important pieces of work. And alongside that, of course, the affordability when it comes to national finances. But the broad case for more investment in defence is something I accept. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danny. Samantha Dixon. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, <clears throat> you'll have to forgive me, this is my first meeting um, with the Treasury Select Committee, so I wasn't in attendance yesterday. So if I cross over anything that was answered yesterday or covered yesterday, I apologise. Um, I was struck earlier on about your observation about different pots of tax not being linked to particular spending. 
Um, I come from a local government background and it, it strikes me we do actually have a tax. It's an adult social care precept of 2%, um, which of course continues to be demanded of citizens across the country along with council tax. So I wanted to just ask you a few questions about um, living standards because in response to your budget, Paul Johnson at the IFS said, we are still heading for a parliament in which people will, on average, be worse off at the end than at the start. So I just wondered how much responsibility you take for that. Well, um, as Paul Johnson and Torsten Bell said at that meeting, that is because we have had a once in a century pandemic, a war in Ukraine. Uh, so what I have to take responsibility for is our response to those very, very big economic shocks. And I believe that the forecasts on living standards are massively better than they were when I became Chancellor. When, the, when I became Chancellor, the OBR was predicting living standards will contract by 2% this year, this financial year. Um, actually, they now think they will go up by 0.8%. Um, and they think that we will get back to pre-pandemic living standards next year, which is two years earlier than they were predicting a year ago. So I think uh, the British economy has shown itself to be much more resilient than many people thought. But of course, in the face of those kinds of shocks, uh, it has a big impact. Why were there no policy um, measures to help pensioner households cope with the persistent reductions in living standards in this budget? There were a lot of policies for pensioners. So, for example, from April, state pension will go up by 8.5%. That's £900 next year. That's uh, around three times the rate of inflation. Um, that I announced at the autumn statement. Um, this time, I announced a huge package of funding for the NHS. The pensioners are the biggest users of the NHS. That's very important public service as far as they're concerned. Um, and if you look at the combined support that we've given for pensioners, uh, I think the Resolution Foundation calculate that they are £1,000 better off in real terms compared to 2010. Um, and for the first time, pensioners are less likely to be in poverty than the rest of the population. So we have always prioritised pensioners and we always will. The Treasury's distributional analysis suggests that the biggest winners from your tax and welfare policies have been the fifth to ninth highest income groups. So why have you provided most financial support to better off households? Well, um, if you look at uh, all my... F I think you, you, you can take an individual measure and uh, look at the, the consequences, but I think a fairer way of doing it is to look at package of measures and if you look at all the measures I've taken in the four fiscal events that I've done they are progressive and in every fiscal event I've taken steps to help people at the bottom of the income scale or people coming into difficulty so in the autumn statement my first autumn statement in 22 uh, we announced cost of living support which has turned out to be a, just over three thousand pounds for the average household uh, we uprated the local housing allowance um, in the autumn statement in November. Uh, that is going to be about uh, £800 for 1.6 million households, you know, very significant help. This time I had the measures on uh, debt relief orders and also extending the uh, payback period for people <coughs> on the universal credit who take out loans from 12 months to 24 months. So I try very hard to make sure that uh, we're supporting people in particular difficulty. You do accept that the wealthier households have done better? From well, um, why did I choose national insurance? Actually, I could have chosen lots of tax cuts that would have helped uh, much wealthier people, but the reason I chose it was because it's most beneficial for growth. So those, uh, that four pence cut in <coughs> national insurance brings around 200,000 people back into the workforce, fills about one in five vacancies across the economy, that creates jobs for lots of people on low pay because I've increased the national living wage to £11.44. Uh, their after-tax real income is now 35% higher for someone working full-time than it would have been in 2010. Um, but once you grow the economy, uh, which you can do with 
that those uh, cuts help to do. That means you can have more money for for helping people in difficulty and more money for public services on whom they depend. This year's budget happened around the time of International Women's Day. So which policies in the budget would you point to that specifically benefit women? Probably the biggest is uh, increasing the threshold at which you have to pay the high income child benefit charge from £50,000 to £60,000. That takes 170,000 families out of paying the charge and it means that uh, about half a million families uh, with uh, young children uh, or children entitled to receive child benefit are going to get about £1,300 a year. I understand that as in this case of every fiscal event in recent years you haven't published an impact assessment of this budget and its individual policy measures in terms of their impact on gender. So what progress are you making in measuring this in the, in the future? Well I have to do an equalities <coughs> impact assessment of all the measures in the budget and I do that uh, before uh, any policies are put to Parliament. If I might just add on the distribution and analysis which um, um, you've asked about. Um, the modelling that the Treasury does that underpins that distribution analysis is um, well, it aims to illustrate the cumulative impact of measures, as the Chancellor said, on, on income levels. Uh, is extremely challenging to produce analysis of a high quality based around other characteristics, including gender, and that's because the assumptions you have to make about a household's makeup actually drive the outcomes of the analysis as opposed to um, the actual policies. Um, themselves. So it is an area that the Treasury looks at with interest in terms of others who are undertaking work in this area, um, including groups that have been before the committee previously. Um, uh, but I think as, as Paul Johnson himself recognised, because most people live in, in households and we don't know how incomes are shared within the household, it's very hard to look at the effects between men and women. Nevertheless, it's an area of analysis we remain extremely interested in. As the Chancellor says, um, we obviously advise him on the equalities impacts in producing the budget. And there are areas of our um, impact assessment of the budget, for example, the HMRC TINS publications, which go beyond our legal responsibilities in terms of equalities impacts and where we are trying to do more. Thank you, Chair. If I may, Chancellor, first of all, a little bit on transport and then something on property. Now, transport wasn't something specifically at the point I'm going to refer to that you raised in this fiscal event, but over previous fiscal events. You have, uh, I'm pleased to say, set up the Network uh, North Fund. And the idea behind that was to use the savings uh, from the council part of HS2 to fund other infrastructure projects. Now, dear to my heart is the Southwest Resilience Programme. And uh, thank you, we've already got the funding for four out of the five phases, but the fifth phase uh, depends very much on some money coming out of this Network North Fund. I understand from uh, Network Rail that they actually need the cash as opposed to a promise from a saving and that they need that in fairly short order by June was my last understanding. Are you able to share with the committee how you are, if you like, converting a saving into cash for these projects to make sure that, that the projects can actually be de delivered on time? Any particular reference to Dawlish I much value. Indeed. Well, I've been on that railway route many times, and it's absolutely stunning. I think one of the most beautiful in the country. Um, but if you go on it, you understand why you need to invest money in resilience, because you are really very close to the sea there. Um, and so you're right that we've allocated, I think it's £165 million to the first four phases. Uh, the fifth phase is very important. I know that the proposal is with the Transport Secretary now. Uh, all I can say is that I know he hopes to make a decision very soon. In which case, um, uh, perhaps there's been a bit of cross wires between the pair of you because I actually spoke to uh, the Secretary of State uh, a week ago and he said it was in your court uh, and he was going to talk to you. Uh, I did express to him my concern about the deadline. So what can I do to get resolution? Is it you? Is it uh, the Secretary of State for Transport? In a way, I'm less bothered about who. I am more concerned about commitment for June. Are you able, Chancellor, to commit that the money will be available when, as I understand it, is needed in June? 
rather than passing you from pillar to post, why don't I commit to you that I will talk to Mark Harper and try and resolve this uh, quickly and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. That would be a great help. Thank you, Chancellor. Moving on to property tax. Now, in uh, the budget, there were really three parts. There was the reduction in the capital gains tax higher rate uh, by 2%. There was the holiday letting uh, relief uh, removal uh, and the multiple dwelling uh, relief removal. And taken together, I think, uh, from the evidence that we've had and indeed from what you said, uh, you were trying to achieve two things. One, clearly, tax to do the things that, that we want to be done um, for our, our public services. But secondly, to maximise the use of property for residential as opposed to anything else. And therefore, might I suggest that this was really a nudge to try to encourage those who had been thinking about disposing of their second homes to do so. Um, because this would be a good time, most uh, tax effective time to do it. Uh, and to look at how those who were uh, letting uh, their properties out, often in the summer and Easter, uh, for Airbnb, might be discouraged by, I think in your words, levelling the playing field so that they, they effectively lost release that gave them a benefit compared with those who let out on uh, full-time uh, residential tenancies. Um, the consequence of which inevitably had a consequence for those uh, uh, properties which were used as part of the tourism industry. So while the objective, which I understand given what we've talked about, the shortage of housing and the need to ensure as many people have homes as we can possibly achieve, inevitably there's a, there's a trade-off because for many coastal uh, and rural communities that tourism piece is actually quite important for the local economy. Did you do an impact assessment when you looked at this to look at the, at the trade-offs to see whether or not you got the balance about right? Well, um, can I just perhaps clarify mm. what we were trying to do and hopefully that will answer your question. Um, so I wasn't saying that I want more properties to be used in this way as opposed mm. to that way. I listened to a lot of colleagues mm. from the West Country actually who were mm. Uh, who said to me they had real concerns that it was difficult for police officers and nurses and public servants to find properties for long-term rental. And the decision I took was really to remove a tax advantage in the system for short-term holiday lets, uh, which I felt was distorting the market. And I was, so I was really trying to dis remove a distortion, but I fully recognise there is a very important role in the tourism industry for short-term lets. And I'm very happy for landlords who continue to want to uh, let their houses through Airbnb. And there's a very important role for long-term lets and long-term residents. But I just didn't think it was appropriate that the tax system should be nudging landlords in one direction or another. When the Office of Tax Simplification looked at this, because I think it was they who originally put forward the suggestion that the holiday letting relief should go. They recognised that this chunk, uh, uh, if you like, of properties are used in, in quite a diverse uh, number of ways. So you've got kind of a, a large number with a very significant business coming off it, and then you've got a tail of um, individuals who are probably doing a bit of, well, wouldn't it be nice to get a bit of extra income? But that tail, um, actually, was unlikely to benefit from the relief because they were unlikely to want to offer up their property for 210 days. So, in a way, by removing the relief, it's not the Airbnb nice to have a bit of extra cash, if you like, second homeowners uh, that are going to be losing out because they never had the advantage in the first place. It's those which were genuinely in business. And when I look at some of the rural um, uh, community um, that I had the pleasure of, of representing, and I think something like 27% of these are in the, the South West, and I, 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 I hear what you say about the other concern, but if I may, but the flip side, which is the concern of these businesses, for many of them, they can't get planning permission to turn, if you're a farmer and you want to diversify, you can't turn some of your farm buildings into 
property which has um, residential use because the district council will not permit it because these are often cottages in the middle of absolutely nowhere. There isn't a bus. Um, I'll be honest, in terms of it being appropriate for a first-time uh, buyer, it will be very expensive and, and so remote as to not be terribly practical. And so the suggestion that the Office of Tax Simplification uh, came up with was um, uh, a, a test. They called it the Bright Line Test. Um, and what they said was, if um, a, a, an individual is letting out a minimum number of properties, and I think they suggested something like five to ten, uh, or clearly or more, if the lets were short term, if there was no personal use we should get rid of the Airbnb, nice to be able to make a little money in the summer, and, and the level of personal um, time involved in the letting, that it should be, it, it should be set out in law that, that was a trade uh, and therefore benefit from the existing um, tax benefit. So I think my ask, um, Chancellor, is that given there are these two distinct groups, you might consider... Um, not least to avoid confusion, what the Office of Tax Simplification suggested, with a view either to making it very clear, these are the criteria which mean you are at trade, and this is not just investment income, um, so that we don't have litigation, which I think at the moment the, uh, the, the accounting bodies have, have, have raised as a concern, um, and or allow them to retain this existing relief, because this is a relatively small part which could be quite clearly defined. Well, um, look, I, I hear the case you make. Um, I suppose my puzzle about what you said, if I may say so, is that uh, what the Office for Tax Simplification proposed seems to me to be rather more complicated than what I actually announced. Um, and so the businesses that you're talking about, there's absolutely nothing that I've announced that would stop a, a farmer getting permission to have short-term holiday lets in uh, an outhouse or a part of their house. Nothing to stop them whatsoever carrying on to do that. <coughs> what I wanted to remove was an incentive in the tax system that would make people <coughs> who could choose the use of their properties to choose holiday lets over long-term rentals. And, and I think that's what I've done. But, you know, please, please do write to me with your thoughts on that particular sector because I fully except the tourism industry is a very, very important one. Uh, that, that's very helpful. See, the group I'm talking about don't have the option of offering uh, uh, tenancies uh, for residential. So effectively, well, you're right. Technically, they can still, uh, if you like, uh, rent on that, on that basis as holiday lets. The business model uh, falls apart, and for them, there isn't an alternative. And I think the group of people that you're trying to influence, as I understand it, are the ones that have an alternative. But I will write to you, and I appreciate your listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amory. Uh, Therese. Uh, thank you, uh, Chancellor. And just slightly building on what uh, Amory's just said, uh, I'm conscious that um, some rural businesses have also contacted me as an MP on that. But at the same time, I'm seeing uh, now terraced homes going for over a million pounds in Southwold. <laughs> Um, which uh, has significantly risen in the last decade. So it's, uh, I understand uh, some of the attractiveness of investment has perhaps been helped by the uh, generous regime, which I think you're trying to balance so it doesn't favour one kind of let over another. Um, can I turn to um, thinking <coughs> about growth? And there's a number of factors. You've particularly mentioned investment today. Could you tell us more about... Uh, we? decided not to go ahead with the um, super deduction um, to move to full-time ex expensing of that investment. Recognising we've got quite a services intensive uh, in this, um, part of our economy, what makes you confident that businesses are going to take advantage of that full expensing? Um, well, the super deduction is a sort of precursor to full expensing. It effectively is the same policy, but it was introduced on a temporary basis. Um, and foot expensing has effectively made those benefits permanent. And the first thing to say is that since the super deduction, uh, we've actually had the second highest growth in business investment in the G7 after Italy, but ahead of America, France, Germany, Japan. So um, I, I think there is some evidence that the policy is working. Um, we have a fantastic services economy. It's a great strength of the UK's, and we want to do everything we can to support it, which is why there was a lot of measures to support financial services 
in my budget speech. But we have a long-term issue with productivity, about 15% less than uh, the United States or Germany. That is not because Brits don't work as hard as, um, as Americans or Germans. Um, actually, Americans probably work longer hours than all of us, but, um, but certainly compared to Europeans, it's not the case. Um, what happens is that in those countries, businesses invest more machinery, more IT, more automation around individual workers. That means that their output is greater. So the reason that we changed uh, our model from one that goes for a low, the lowest possible headline rate of corporation tax uh, to one which has a slightly higher but still the lowest in the G7 headline rate but more capital allowances is to incentivize that investment in plant <coughs> machinery which has historically been behind um, those other countries. And combined with the other measures I announced to boost investment which boost investment by around 20 billion a year um, over a period of time. Um, that closes about half the gap, we believe, with, with countries like Germany. So there's still more work to do, but that's the reason for focusing on investment. One of the other elements that came out was the um, you're quite keen for pension schemes to get more involved investment, particularly uh, investment uh, domestically. Uh, I'm conscious, uh, I saw this when I was at DWP, uh, that some of the returns... Uh, lower risk, lower return, that, what impact that can have for future pensioners, but also how you balance that, though, with the fiduciary duty. So can you tell me more about why, what's triggering this? Because I know we get foreign pension schemes investing in stru- infrastructure in this country. Um, what do you hope to achieve in terms of uh, how substantial change there'll be? Um, well, the first thing is that um, the most important duty... Uh, of a pension fund is to get the best possible returns for pensioners. And we're not changing that at all. That is how it should be. Um, But um, they have, to date, been assessed by their regulators on uh, the costs of their investments, the annual management charges and so on, not the overall returns. And what we've seen in other countries, uh, particularly Australia, is a different model where they have consolidated their pension funds, Canada's done the same, and the result is that they are managing larger pools of money, Um, they're able to get more professional investment teams, and when they have those, they're able to allocate a proportion, it's only a small proportion, they're able to allocate a proportion of their portfolio, maybe 10%, to higher risk but higher return growth stocks. Uh, which the majority of our pension funds tend to avoid. We've got 30,000. So our reforms are designed to provoke a consolidation, which will not happen overnight. It'll be a decade or more for it to happen, but to follow the journey that they've been on in Australia. Um, And as as part of that, as we start to get more professionally managed pension funds, uh, we think they will start to notice the brilliant growth stocks that we have in this country, um, where at the moment we have the great irony that if you are a uh, a brilliant UK tech entrepreneur, you're more likely to get investment from a Canadian pension fund than a British pension fund, even though British pension funds collectively have got more money to invest than Canadian pension funds, and we'd like to put that right. Um, So going further on that, in terms of, um, I mean, traditionally the Prudential Regulatory Authority has actually been very negative about <coughs> consolidation of super funds and similar. What's changed? Um, well, we've had very good discussions with them. I, I think uh, I can't say uh, what they were like when you were DWP secretary, but I've had meetings with the pensions regulator, um, the, the FCA, the PRA, and I think they're very supportive of the direction of travel that we're going in because we believe, and I think they believe, this will mean higher returns for pensioners. Some of the things that um, you seem to be in strong agreement with uh, OBR, uh, some of the dynamic <coughs> effects of what you're doing on, um, say, reducing NI and similar, um, in terms of the equivalent of nearly 100,000 uh, employees coming into uh, the market. There are other barriers to people perhaps working to their full extent. Um, in terms of childcare, there's been some questioning about how far along we are in really um, liberating that to help uh, working people. 
What's, um, if you like, uh, one of the key changes that you want to make sure not just happens by uh, next month, but um, in the next, uh, say, two to three years? Well, I think the childcare reforms that I announced in the budget a year ago are genuinely transformative because uh, they remove that hiatus when a, between when a baby is nine months old and when a baby is uh, three. Um, and they mean that uh, childcare support is available right from the moment that a mother might be wanting to go back to work. And um, that will mean that we, the economy loses a lot less of the talent than it currently loses. It is a huge uh, increase in childcare provision, probably around 40,000 more staff and around 170,000 more childcare places across the country. That means a big investment by the sector. Uh, that's why I've been working with the Education Secretary uh, to give them the certainty they need to make that investment. So in the budget we announced the rates that we will uh, pay for that childcare over the next two years so that they've got the certainty. We think that will unlock about half a billion pounds of additional investment in the sector. Uh, and uh, you know, the first stage will be this April. Um, then we roll it out. Next stage is uh, this September and then finally next September. Going further than that, though, um, I think it's uh, we'd already been spending about six billion pounds a year on childcare. How do you see that uh, still then evolving in terms of public spending? Does it need to go higher? Um, well, I think these reforms, although they notionally mean a significant extra expenditure by the state because we're extending the thirty hours offer to children over nine months, when you factor in the additional number of parents in the workforce who wouldn't have otherwise been in the workforce. Uh, you get the majority of the extra cost back. So it increases the productive capacity of the economy. So it is an example of the OBR doing something they haven't done previously, which is dynamically scoring the impact of government policies. Um, and uh, as they've done with national insurance uh, cuts as well. And I think, um, you know, it is welcome for that. To be fair to the OBR, yesterday they talked about how they'd looked at some of their previous modelling because they didn't really give much credit a few years ago when we reduced the taper rate on, or the government reduced the taper rate on um, universal credit. Um, other welcome elements will be things like the fuel duty freeze. Again, a significant um, amount of money uh, being um, foregone on the escalator. When I asked, um, I think it was members of the MPC, um, talking about interest rates and they're saying well we have to go with the formal policy of the government and we predict that uh, fuel duty will go up that will be inflationary and therefore we can't do it when everybody knows that you weren't going to put up fuel duty so why don't we just scrap that as a future policy and stop the dance that happens and we can then get on hopefully the MPC will get on with some interest rate cuts because it costs uh, to do so it costs five billion pounds a year which we don't have and so that is the reason why um, me and previous chancellors have to take this policy on a budget by budget basis. Um, of course, I would like to, for any future budgets I do, to continue with this freeze, but I have to take the decision on a budget by budget basis as to whether I can afford to do so. In terms of productivity, what the OBR suggested to us is if we went to just pre pandemic, levels within the public sector, that would release tens of billions of pounds. From what I think I heard you say earlier, if we achieve those levels, uh, that would certainly compensate for what uh, others are suggesting could lead to cuts. In fact, we could actually continue to see uh, increases in public spending as we have throughout the lifetime of the government since 2010. Um, tell me more, though, about how we really are getting that productivity done. If I, I asked James Bowler a few uh, a couple of months ago, I think it was, when they gave evidence to ask what benefit the infrastructure IPA had done in terms of speeding up uh, some of these this work. And in written response, because he couldn't come up with an answer at the time, I think he pointed to basically one project, and that was only to not build accommodation. Is there a risk that we've overcomplicated delivery within public sector that sounds good on paper, but actually has fallen flat? Um. I think there's two different questions buried in there, if I may. Um, the first thing is we definitely need to speed up infrastructure delivery. Uh, we've done a lot, but we need to do a lot more. Um, so in the autumn statement, for example, I announced plans that would halve the 
time it would take to get a connection to the national grid for clean energy projects. Some people were being told it would take them 14 years to get a connection. We're completely overhauling that. Big reforms to business planning applications, a fast tracking process so that people can get their answer back much more quickly, uh, alongside more investment in local authorities planning departments. So definitely we need to make more progress on that. In terms of productivity, perhaps this is true, and this is, I think, why it's so important that I laid out the argument in the budget. Um, you know, the OBR say that if we um, increase productivity by 5%, that's a 20 billion saving. Um, and our plans, if we deliver them, will increase productivity by more than 5%, and we can make sure that with the 1% spending assumption, we don't have to have damaging cuts to the services value by the public. But delivery is everything. It is very challenging. So I want to give you an example of how we're going to make sure that happens in the NHS. So as part of the agreement with the NHS, of course you know it well as a former health secretary, um, the head of the NHS has agreed that we will uh, measure productivity with independent verification, not just for the whole NHS, but for every NHS organisation, every trust, uh, every ICB, uh, on a quarterly basis. Um, and that there will be carrot and stick incentives for the people leading those organisations to deliver on productivity. So we're not just talking about big bang, you know, hospital electronic record systems. We're talking about the chief executive of a hospital having an objective every quarter, every <coughs> year, to deliver small scale improvements of productivity in every area of their operations that means that they are on track to help the NHS deliver its overall 2% productivity gains. Having run the NHS um, myself, and, the, and you have, I think that will mm. change the way the NHS works and it will make it transformatively more efficient. Um, and so the next question is, that's the NHS, how do we do something similar for the police, prison service, the courts, other parts of the public sector? A very big job. That's the journey we started at the budget. One final question, um, if that's okay. Um, procurement's a big issue. I know that James Cartledge brought out a plan recently, which will be transformational too if it succeeds. Can I just go back? I think Samantha talked a bit about local government and adult social care and similar. Um, quite a lot of local government pension schemes are overfunded, significantly overfunded. And I know that some councils are quite keen to either have a pension holiday or reduce their contributions. Um, I think some are about 140% funded and similar. Is there, at the moment, the Scheme Advisory Board has gone against any changes, but surely that's sensible because that's almost taking fiduciary duty too far um, in what's there, while at the same time council tax could be used perhaps to do some of the services in the, in the shorter term. Um, I'll take that one away if I may. Um, we didn't announce big changes to reform what happens with DB pension schemes in the budget. Our, the thrust of what we announced was DC DC, schemes. Yeah. Um, but if I may, I'll take that one away and get back to you. Okay. Well, we've got a few further quickfire questions, Chancellor, starting with Keir. Thank you. Uh, Chancellor, I did just want to pick up a further point about the NIC abolition ambition. We've had quite a lot of fluffy language in this session about what your aspiration is for when it could be achieved. And I just wondered whether you could provide any sort of explanation of what you mean by when economic circumstances allow. What do those economic conditions look like? Or maybe a time scale. I know that a comparative figure of 12 years was used earlier. Is there any further detail you could give us? Um, I can't give you a time scale because this is going to be the work of, of many parliaments. Um, and the reason I can't give you a time scale is because I've said there are very two very clear conditions uh, upon which the delivery of this ambition depends. One is that it won't be uh, funded by borrowing and the other is that it won't be funded by cuts to public services. So that means that ultimately it depends on the growth of the economy. Now I can't predict the rate at, that will, at which it will grow. What I can say is that I have very big confidence that the measures that I announced in the budget and the autumn statement will put us on the path to substantially higher levels of growth over the um, short and medium term. So there are economic conditions in which you'd implement this policy, but you can't tell us what they are? Uh, I can't tell you because I can't tell you what the growth rate of the economy is going forward, unfortunately. And then, um, secondly, the House of Commons Library has said that merging NICs and income tax would require an 8% increase in the basic and higher rates of income tax. 
would you like to use this as an opportunity to say categorically that you wouldn't raise income tax in order to, to bring this policy to fruition? We want to deliver this policy by uh, reducing national insurance. That is our stated plan, um, and, uh, that's, and that's the way we've done it in the last two fiscal events. So not through raising income tax? I've explained how we want to do it. Our, our objective is to end the unfairness and uh, reducing national insurance is the way we intend to go about True. it. And um, then just finally, on, on the comms point around this decision, you've said that this is some sort of far-sighted aim, that it would just be fantastic if we could do this. At the same time, post-budget, a lot of Conservative front benches have been fronting up this policy proposal in the media as if it is something coming down the track. Do you, would you like to use this as an opportunity to assuage people's hopes that you actually have a plan to do this anytime soon? Well, we have a plan to do it. It's a very um, important, and I think in a general election year, you know, this is very distinct to the Labour Party. You've said they don't want to do this. We think that this, is, this will mean that we grow more. It will make work pay in the economy. Um, it is a long-term goal, just like some of the other long-term goals that previous Conservative administrations have announced uh, but we can't tell you when we're going to deliver it because that depends on economic growth but it's something that we think will be transformative for the economy and we are committed to. So you can't tell us the economic conditions in which you do it or whether you do it through raising income tax but I suppose they might be questions for a future session. Thank you Chair. Thank you. John. Chancellor, uh, can I take us to the dark art of forecasting? We've got the Bank of England and the OBR are at almost opposite ends of the spectrum with regards to inflation and growth. Uh, inflation, the bank is expecting a tick up to 3%. The OBR has halved its forecast from 2.8 roughly to 1.4 by the end of the year. On growth, the OBR is a full 3% ahead of the bank next year. A big number. <coughs> I mean, it does, it, does it worry you that monetary policy in one respect is being guided by you know, the Bank of England forecasts and fiscal policy by, certainly not guided, but certainly steered to a certain extent by the OBR forecast because there's such a disparity in those forecasts? It's a very reasonable question to ask. My experience is that um, those forecasts tend to be published at different points mm and actually they feed off each other. So uh, the Bank of England looks at what the OBR forecasts, tries to understand what they've done and see what they can learn from it and vice versa. Uh, so in practice, I think that difference is probably not as big as, not as stark as it looks right now. Do you, do you think there's anything more that could be done I actually bring more of a co coordinated response in the sense that when we raised this, or when I raised it with the OBR um, economists, um, in the OBR session yesterday afternoon, they said that there should be better coordination and liaison. I take your point about points in time, very valid, but those disparities are quite large and we should have a, a, an overall economic policy where monetary and fiscal policy are at least connected in some form, but uh, this risks that not being the case. It's a very fair point. Um, I don't disagree at all. Um, I would just say that I think that our system does depend on both those sets of forecasters being independent, so I wouldn't want to get involved in that process in a way that undermine that independence. All right. Finally, just switching to the NatWest share sale, I've raised, I've raised, we've had a brief discussion about this, but would I ask you, can I please ask you to continue to consider Lord John Lee's suggestion in the other place that a certain number of hundred pounds worth of shares, 250, 500 quid's worth, which is minuscule in the big scheme of things, even when it's distributed to every single school in the land, secondary school, you give consideration to that because then students would be empowered to take control of that shareholding given the decent yield and determine, I don't know, policies at the margin that when it had to spend the dividends and so forth. It could be an education in finance and help further that objective. We will absolutely keep it under consideration, yes. Thank you, John. I don't think any of my other colleagues have questions, but I've got a few last ones uh, very quickly. Um, so before the NatWest share sale, does the UK ISA need to be established before that happens? Um, that is a very good question. Um, uh, we're actually calling it the British ISA. 
Um, and um, I, I will look into those timings because uh, it's an interesting point. Okay. Are the Treasuries consulting currently with the FCA on changing the advice guidance boundary uh, so that it makes advice, access to financial advice more accessible for a wider range of people? Does that need to have been implemented before the NatWest share sale? And at a risk of repeating myself, rather than giving you an ill-informed answer, I would like to take that away and look into it if I may, Chair. Okay. Um, the Office for Budget Responsibility was asked to look into the uh, tax-free shopping issue, and they published extensively on it in their report that was issued last Wednesday. Is that the matter closed as far as you are concerned as Chancellor? We will continue to keep it under review. Um, you know, I think all things being equal, I would rather that foreign tourists were spending their money in the UK uh, than in other countries um, and if I could find a way to make that policy affordable I would love to do it. So far I've not been able to but I will continue to keep it under review. Okay, thank you. You've told us previously that you don't like temporary tax cuts. You've extended the 5p off the price of fuel on a temporary basis for another year. Um, Faced with the choice uh, between extending that further and cutting national insurance by another 1%, which would you prefer? I think that's a difficult question for me to answer because that would be uh, potentially one of the trade-offs that I would face in uh, future budgets. To date, mm -hmm. I've been able to do both. Um, and, you know, I'm very sympathetic to continuing the freeze, but I just don't know. Um, and I think, you know, I don't think I could really predict now uh, if I was forced to choose which one I would, um, because I think it would depend on the economic circumstances at the time. Uh, which leads me to my final question. You mentioned uh, future budgets. There's only been just over 100 days between this one and the autumn statement, so can we expect that we'll have you back here talking about your next one in July, September? Well, if uh, a budget happens in July or September, it would be with great pleasure that I would return in front of you, but um, uh, that is not a decision that has been made. Well, I think if there are no further questions from colleagues, then we'll draw this session to a close. Uh, thank you very much for your time, Chancellor. Order, order.